Good afternoon, everyone. It is Thursday, March 9th, 2023, and I call this meeting of the Senate Elections Committee to order. And we do have a quorum. Uh, we have two bills on the agenda today. Senate File 2270 is Senator Morrison, and Senate File, uh, what's our second one number? I guess we don't need to know the number. 1570, which is Senator Coleman. Uh, Need to, need to be sure everyone understands that we are in uh, the second to the last day of deadlines, and so there's a lot of pressure to get things done right now, and every minute of our day is being scheduled. So I thank you for coming uh, on time. Thank you to uh, getting a quorum. And uh, we are going to uh, first start out with a, because there's a lot of interest in this first bill, and I want to lay out the plan for the hearing. Uh, we'll adopt the author's amendments to get the bill into the shape that the author needs. Uh, that's usually a, a, an author's amendment that uh, we all will uh, accept. Uh, then uh, we'll hear from members of the public who signed up to testify. And we're giving 15 minutes to proponents and 15 minutes to the opponents. Senator Morrison may have, have uh, a subject matter come in seat with her. Uh, at the time uh, after uh, testimony, and you know, that person can be at the uh, at the desk and assist her to responding to questions. Then we'll go to amendments from members, and then there'll be time for member discussion, during which we'll have an opportunity to ask the author and testifiers questions about the proposal. We plan to vote on this at 4:30, and move to on to Senator Coleman's bill. Uh, with that being said, we'll now begin. I have one question from Senator Anderson, if it's quick. That was just, my question was, are we going to vote on it, or is it going to be laid over? That was the... Thank you, Senator Anderson. And you already yes, said we're going we to vote. we are going to vote on it. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Crank. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Chair, you just described, and, and to put an uh, artificial time limit on something that I think is extremely important, um, if you're, you intend to change the entire election process, I would imagine we could consume the entire time allotted for, for this committee in addition to uh, other times. All I've heard this whole session is that we have the best, cleanest, fair, most trustworthy election system in the entire state or in the entire country, yet this is yet another bill that will um, change every single aspect of the system that you said was the greatest in the, in the, uh, in the country. And so I think it's uh, unfair to both sides to be able to fairly and, art fairly and accurately articulate um, their opposition and or their, their support for it and for us to thoroughly vet this bill before you take a vote on it. So I would request that we should certainly allow more time and to make sure that the, the debate is exhausted before any vote is considered. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Senator Korn. Uh, this bill has been uh, introduced a while ago already and you've had plenty of time to uh, read it and decide on what kinds of changes you might have. And this is not the end. We are, this is the hearing to introduce it. We will have it debated on the floor as well. Senator, Mr. Chair, um, this is the, the committee of origin. This is our primary focus is elections. So I see no higher priority than to, to focus on this election bill for what, what time it's required. Thank you. Thank you for uh, expressing that. Um, so what we have is uh, Senator Morrison. Uh, I understand you have an author's amendment. Uh, and Senator Westland moves the A1 author's amendment to get the bill into the form which you'd like to have it. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Aye. The motion is adopted. Uh, Senator Westland, from what I understand, you have uh, a, another amendment, the A1 amendment. I'm sorry. Uh, A3 amendment. A1 was the author's amendment. Okay. A3 amendment. Uh, would you like that considered now? Yes, and, please, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Senator Morrison, would you like to explain it or would you like to have counsel go through that, that uh, amendment? You know, it's a lot of technical changes, so why don't we have counsel walk through it, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair? Thank you, Senator Weston. Uh, counsel. Please go through the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm looking at the A3 amendment, which amends the A1 amendment that was previously adopted. On page one, line three, 
um, it corrects an incorrect date. There were two dates in 2025, so this moves one of those reporting dates to 2026. Uh, section or lines four through six define the term political subdivision, which is a term that was used throughout the bill, so now it's defined. Um, lines one through, or lines eight through 10 uh, amend the definition of repeat candidate ranking. Lines 11 and 12 allow local jurisdictions to adopt ranked choice voting after January, January 1st, 2024 instead of July 1st. Uh, lines 13, <coughs> excuse me, and 14 and 15 all refer to the use of the definition of political subdivision, which was used earlier, defined earlier. Line 16 specifies that the local government uh, can use a separate ballot card if necessary um, to separate ranked choice voting elections and non-ranked choice voting elections. Line 17 deletes a subdivision, which reappears later in the amendment. And line 18 is a consequential renumbering of subdivisions. Section uh, line 19 allows people to review ballot images in the same way as ballots. And then lines 20 through 27 are the subdivision that were deleted are now, is now reappearing here and correcting a cross-reference. 28 and 29 are correcting a cross-reference. Line 30 is correcting a missing word. On page two, changes the word contest to office to be more consistent with um, other election laws. Line two corrects a cross-reference. Um, a mistaken reference now is corrected. Uh, lines three and four um, provide clarity to which subdivision was being referred to or which paragraph is being referred to by describing that paragraph. And line five adds a reference to a different law and this section to make sure that the section applies as well as the cross-reference. There are several lines on line six. There are several lines of the bill that are deleted having to do with um, some of the hand counting, and that was uh, some of those lines were duplicative of things that were already in the bill. Lines 9 through 11 have to do, or 9 through 12 have to do um, with when a machine is shown to be inaccurate, um, that it can't be used again until it is reapproved. Um, a similar concept is in the DE, but this is um, reworked to be a little more clear. And then finally on line 13 adds, if applicable, um, in reference to the ballot board needing to follow the requirements of ranked choice voting, if applicable. Thank you, Ms. Stengel. Um, at this point, I think I, I would like to explain one simple thing for, because we have so many people here that have never been to a hearing before, that a, um, the author's amendment is an amendment that uh, brings the bill up to date, and in this particular case, it's called a delete everything or a DE amendment, and it, that's only used when there's so many changes that it's just better to not go through all the single steps that are being changed, and you use the, the term delete all just because it's simpler. And then what, uh, what the amendment that we're looking at right now, the A3 amendment, brings it even more up to date with the corrections that we find in the meantime. So we have the corrections uh, amendment right now, uh, and what we'll do is we'll vote on that. All in favor of the A3 amendment, please uh, signify by aye. 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 All opposed? No. The motion is adopted. The A3 is adopted. Mr. Mr. Chair. Senator Grant. Um, you know, for all in training, I appreciate it. I think it's excellent to help educate everyone on the on the process and so we don't get tied up in internal language here um, in, inside baseball. But just so everybody is aware, it looks like the delete everything amendment, um, which could have fundamentally changed every aspect of the bill because of all the changes you mentioned, um, was available at 2.29 p.m. today. So you mentioned earlier in your statements that we had more than ample time to review it. You're right. We did of the original bill, but certainly not um, for the amendment the delete everything amendment, and so our testifiers are unable to be completely prepared um, when it's 
thrust upon them just a half hour before the committee. So again, I would ask for uh, time to make sure this bill gets its proper hearing. And if we could have more timely amendments, it is your chief author bill. It is your, um, one of your primary bills. I know it's a priority of yours. And I would think that with all the work you've done, we could have had the amendments uh, or the final bill um, much earlier than a half hour before the committee. Thank you. Well, Senator, Senator Cran, that's a nice speech, except that uh, if you look at the delete all amendment, it was printed on 308 at 1126 AM, and it was posted yesterday. So um, we, we need to be accurate when we, when we talk about things like that. So uh, Senator Morrison, please uh, explain your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, members, thank you for considering Senate File 2270. Toxic politics and division are damaging our democracy. For years, it's impacted our ability to problem solve and address issues, even issues that are broadly popular because of the gridlock in our government. Ranked choice voting is one of the best steps we can take to reduce our political divisions and strengthen our democracy. Ranked choice voting, sometimes called instant runoff voting, is a simple but powerful change to the way we vote that empowers voters to rank candidates in order of preference and ensures winners with the majority support in a single decisive and cost-effective election. In ranked choice elections, candidates must appeal to their opponent's supporters for second and third choice votes. And they do that by running positive campaigns that focus on policy, policy solutions rather than personal attacks. That's exactly the antidote we need to address our political divisions and promote more civil, representative, and inclusive elections. We've seen ranked choice voting work successfully and effectively at a local level in Minnesota and around the country and in the states of Maine and Alaska. Recent polling shows that Minnesotans across the state are ready for ranked choice voting in our state and federal elections, and this bill provides that pathway. The Protect and Advance Democracy Act, or Senate File 2270, does three things. It establishes a task force to develop standards, procedures, and a timeline for implementing ranked choice voting statewide, and provides an appropriation for that task force's work. Second, it allows local jurisdictions to adopt ranked choice voting for local elections if they choose. And third, it provides grants to local jurisdictions for implementation and voter education. In drafting the bill, we sought feedback from county election officials and the Secretary of State's office and incorporated that feedback into the bill. We added the task force as well as an extended timeline for implementation at their urging. To make the promises of this reform a reality, we must have a date certain for implementation, and the amendment we adopted requires that recommendation from the task force. Ranked choice voting is the best step we can take to mitigate the polarization and extremism of infecting our politics, and it's incumbent on all elected officials, particularly those who promise voters to safeguard our democracy, to take steps to meet that commitment. And now, Mr. Chair and members, I think we can start with testifiers. And I should warn you, Mr. Chair, that I will be departing during some testimony to present to the Capital Investment Committee, and we'll be right back. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Um, and yes, I understand that you are double doing double duty during this uh, bill presentation. Uh, we are ready to go with testifiers. And I want to remind the testifiers to be concise um, because we, have we will allow 15 minutes for the pro and 15 minutes for the opponents. And if anybody takes longer, they're taking away the time from the, the last people and they're going to be cut off. So, Mr. Uh, Chair, quick Senator question. Mo Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, will there be a point in today for walking through the A1 amendment, which as you pointed out, was yesterday, uh, but that's only yesterday, and the, we've done a lot of activity uh, since yesterday. So a walk through the A1 uh, would be a helpful thing at some point today. Even by council. Uh. Thank you, Senator Matthews, and uh, I think Perhaps we can do that with, uh, if council will take that on. So, uh, 
Sorry, Senator Morrison, we'll do that uh, walkthrough first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I will sort of keep it at a high level and not get into all of the math of ranked choice voting. If there's questions about that, we can certainly get into, you know, I'm happy to answer questions. And I know there's other people um, that the senator has brought to talk about that as well. Um, so starting on page one of the A1 amendment, Article 1 establishes a new task force called the Statewide Ranked Choice Voting Implementation Task Force. Uh, and this task force will look at ranked choice voting um, and engage election officials and make recommendations to the legislature on what standards should be in place for ranked choice tabulation um, and how and reporting processes and then also report back on a timeline for when um, ranked choice voting should be implemented for all federal and state elections. Uh, the group, there are 20 some members of the task force and you can see those starting on line, page one, line 12, including four legislators, um, some locally elected officials and then several other entities also have appointments. Uh, this, a lot of the language in here is very standard for task forces, how they're organized, when they're meeting. Um, there are two co-chairs that are legislators, the members appointed by the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader. Um, the task force is supported by the Legislative Coordinating Commission. On page two, lines 29 and 30, you'll see that there are annual reports starting in 2024 going through 2027. And the task force must submit these annual reports um, talking about their progress on each of the items specified on page three. The task force can also decide that um, it has completed its work prior to its final report in 2027 and vote um, by a vote of the task force can say that the earlier report is the final report. And the task force will sunset on June 30th, 2027 or after it submits its final report, whichever is later. And then there's a blank appropriation um, to the LCC to support the, the work of the task force. Article two is about implementing ranked choice voting and it establishes a new chapter of law, which is chapter 204E. Section one on page three specifies that to this new chapter will govern all ranked choice voting elections. And uh, Minnesota election law applies to the extent that it is not overridden by this chapter. On page four, um, five and six are um, definitions that relate to ranked choice voting and all of the terminology specific to ranked choice voting. I'll note that the other definitions, um, sort of the standard definitions in chapter 200 also apply. Section three on page seven talks about uh, adoption for by local governments, and this was amended by the A1, so or the A3, so after January 1st, 2024, um, a political subdivision, which is a county, home rule charter, statu or statutory city, or a school district, can adopt ranked choice voting um, for its local elections. And they may do so by adopting the statute by reference. Um, a charter jurisdiction can adopt a different method other than what's provided in 204E. Then there are provisions about um, timing. It has to be done um, no later than 90 days before filing for office and the same for if they choose not to use ranked choice voting anymore. Um, and notifications must be made to the Secretary of State if ranked choice voting will be used. Section four on the bottom of page seven is the ballot format um, requiring that if there are more than three candidates uh, for a particular office, a voter must be allowed to rank at least three candidates for each office and there must be instructions on how to complete the ballot. If there is an, on top of page eight, subdivision two, if there is an election that has both ranked choice voting and non-ranked choice voting, um, those types, of, the, the ballot must be separated so that the ranked choice voting pieces are separate from the other pieces. And if needed, it can be put onto a second um, ballot. And local election officials have to adopt the necessary procedures uh, related to ballot format um, as provided in that section. Section five on page eight requires uh, the ele local election official to designate um, one place that is the ranked choice voting tabulation center, which is where all of the materials come back to after uh, the voting concludes on election day and where they are processed. Um, Write-in votes, people that want to have their write-in votes must file a written request to have their votes counted. Um, and these write-in votes are reviewed and recorded at the 
tabulation center after election day. Ranked choice um, voting tabulation starts once all of the votes have been received and re uh, recorded. Um, and it must continue until it's completed, with the exception of being able to go f for a recess, um, and that's provided in Subdivision 4. And a recess uh, must include a notice posted about when they're coming back. Uh, and, um, that was a subdivision that was moved in the A3 amendment, so that you'll see that in a different location on the next engrossment. Section six has to do with single seat elections. So when you, there's a ranked choice voting election, when there is um, only one seat available, uh, this is how that method will work. Um, paragraph B talks about the first round of tabulation. If somebody receives um, enough votes to win the election, then the counting ends there. If the person doesn't meet that threshold, then there are additional rounds of tabulation um, and candidates continue to be eliminated until a winner is declared. Section seven is the same sort of concept only for elections where there are multiple seats for an office. So for example, uh, maybe a local office where you're electing several city council candidates or something like that would use this process. And again, you have the first round, and if there are no winners uh, in the first round, then there are additional um, rounds where candidates are eliminated until uh, a candidate is declared the winner. On page 12, uh, there are requirements about reporting results. Um, there has to be a precinct summary statement, which includes the number of first choice choices cast for each candidate in that precinct. And there is a tabulation summary statement, um, which includes all of the things in current law, plus several additional items. Uh, and that must be um, provided with the other election materials. Section 9 allows for recounts of ranked choice voting elections. Uh, if a candidate is defeated in the final round, they can request a recount under the system used in current law. If they're defeated in an earlier round, the, this, this section governs that recount. Um, when doing a recount, they can, uh, instead of starting at the very beginning, the recount starts at the round where that requesting candidate is eliminated. And a candidate cannot request a recount until a winner is determined. Section 10 is a post-election review, which requires after the canvas, the election official must re hand count um, a specified number of precincts to ensure that the um, voting equipment is accurate. Uh, if the you can see that there are different provisions based on the size of the precinct and um, what if there's single seat or multi seat races. Um, if the voting equipment is found to have a higher threshold than acceptable, there's an additional review needed. You can see that at the top of page 15, and that requires additional review of additional um, precincts. Uh, the result, the local election official must report results to the county auditor, and then the results are made public. If a voting system is found to have failed to record votes accurately, it can't be used until it's recertified for use. And section 11 allows the Secretary of State to adopt rules necessary to implement ranked choice voting. Article three has a series of sections um, that have to do with ranked choice voting but are elsewhere uh, in existing law. Section one adds a cross-reference um, to the new uh, chapter 204E in talking about ballot preparation. Sections two and three add, on page 16, add definitions of ranked choice voting elections by cross-referencing uh, the definition in 204E. Section four has to do with the precinct summary statements, which I mentioned before, and you'll see on the top of page 17, it cross-references the requirements in 204E. Section five says that when candidates are for nonpartisan offices are in a ranked choice voting election, they are not placed on the primary ballot because there will be no primary. Section six, when the notice of the first data file of affidavits of candidacy is put out, that notice must indicate whether ranked choice voting or non-ranked choice voting will be used. The next section has to do with um, certification of election uh, equipment and it requires that the vendor obtain a test report from a voting system test lab instead of being certified by an independent testing authority. And then there are some language changes. On page 18, section 
eight has to do with municipalities, um, saying that municipalities can only use voting equipment that has been approved by the Secretary of State, except for it may use um, tabulating equipment or software reallocation features that um, have not been approved by the Secretary of State if it has been tested to be accurate and meets the city ordinance's requirements. Section, two, section 9 on the bottom of page 18 requires voting systems purchased in Minnesota after the effective date of this act um, to have certain capabilities um, that are listed uh, at the bottom of 18 and top of 19, including some specific to ranked choice voting. Section 10 requires the public accuracy test to include a test of ranked choice voting if ranked choice voting will be used. And that same language is on the top of page 20. Section 11 on page 20 has to do with the state canvassing board and requires the state canvassing board to um, account for ranked choice voting if it's used, except for if the national um, popular vote compact has been adopted, in which case that will govern how presidential, nominate, nom presidential nominees are awarded. Uh, section 12 has to do with um, reports for local officials that are running for office and the timing when there's no primary, it specifies when that report is due. And then finally, Article 4 sets up a new ranked choice voting grants that allows um, local governments to apply to the Secretary of State for grants for money to help them implement ranked choice voting by buying equipment or doing public education campaigns. Um, there's a local, an unspecified local match required uh, and the Secretary of State must report back to the legislature on the grants that it makes. And then in section two, there's a blank appropriation from the general fund to the Secretary of State for the cost of implementing this act and a certain amount of that must be used for the grants. And that is it, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Madam uh, <laughs> Council. <laughs> and uh, Senator, Senator Morrison. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Stangle, for taking us through that. I just wanted to note that uh, Congress person Mary Peltola was supposed to join us, um, but she she was elected by ranked choice voting in Alaska along with Lisa Murkowski to Senate um, this past year, and she was going to come share their experience in Alaska, but she's very busy in D.C., is unable to come and sends her regrets. I just wanted to note that. Thank you, Senator Morrison. We are ready to go to the... Uh, Yeah, we had a little bit of a, a uh, glitch here, but uh, it's been fixed. And uh, what we have is uh, Red Wing City Council member Becky Norton via Zoom. Please identify yourself for the uh, record and continue with your testimony. Yeah, um, I'm, yes, I'm sorry. My name is Becky Norton, and I'm an elected member of the city, Red Wing City Council. Welcome and continue with your testimony. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair uh, Chair Carlson and members of the committee. Thank you for your service on the Elections Committee. As I said, I'm Becky Norton and I'm the Red, um, Red Wing City Council member. Minnesota has almost a 20 year history with ranked choice voting starting in 2004 when the nonpartisan League of Women Voters of Minnesota completed an exhaustive two year study of the voting systems and reached a consensus that endorsed ranked choice voting as an option for local and state elections. The popularity and momentum for ranked choice voting continues to grow across the county and the country and in states and counties and cities, including Minnesota cities, Bloomington, Minneapolis, Minnetonka, St. Louis Park, and St. Paul. Red Wing has long waited, wanted to have the conversation around ranked choice voting. In 2019, our city council passed a resolution in support of ranked choice voting local options that would have removed barriers to ranked choice voting, which is part of the current bill of uh, Senate file 2270. With all these barriers in place, our community can't even have a dialogue about ranked choice voting. All cities should have the opportunity to decide what system is best for their local elections. That's key to both local control and a th thriving local democracy. Ranked choice voting is a tried and tested election reform in our state, with nearly 20% of Minnesota voters already using this method of voting with great success. Importantly, ranked choice voting has been shown to open the door for more voices, foster greater diversity, incentivize civility, and improve voter turnout. 
all voters find it easy to use. We are eager to consider ranked choice voting for Red Wing elections, and I'm personally excited that the current bill not only allows local jurisdictions the opportunity to adopt ranked choice voting, but will enact ranked choice voting for state and federal elections as well. What is good for our local communities is good for our state. Ranked choice voting offers me and my neighbors the opportunity to vote for our preferred candidate without the fear that we are throwing out, throwing our vote away. This simple act upholds the promise of democracy and is more reflective of all Minnesota voices. For too long, we have been held hostage by the current method. Isn't voting, isn't voting, isn't democracy about being heard, about voting our values? More importantly, we want to have this conversation at the local level so our residents can have an honest conversation about what ranked choice voting might look like in Red Wing. And that's exactly the Protect and Advance Democracy Act, Senate File 2270 provides. And I urge you to pass this measure. And thank you for your service and your time today. Thank you, Ms. Norton. We have another uh, testifier on Zoom, uh, Brooke Carlson from the Rochester, the Rochester City Council president. And uh, uh, after that, uh, that testifier, we're gonna go to local testifiers and I'm going to ask that people will uh, monitor themselves and come up as, as needed. So, Ms. Norton, please continue. Uh, sorry, Ms. Uh, Carlson. Carlson should be an Carlson. easy one for you, Chair yeah, Carlson. It should be an easy one, <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank Carlson, you very much, please. Chair Carlson and members. My name is Brooke Carlson. I'm the council president for the Rochester City Council. As you can see from your materials, the city of Rochester passed a resolution three years ago prior to me joining uh, um, in March of 2020, supporting removing regulatory barriers and giving all local jurisdictions in Minnesota the option to use ranked choice voting and that this legislation be added as a priority in the Rochester legislative agenda until passed. I'm here today to speak in support of the local option portion of the bill that would allow cities the option to utilize a ranked choice local election system that would be implemented the same as other cities in the state if Rochester were cons to consider implementing ranked choice voting. This bill could provide the potential to have an informed and robust local conversation on the issue to see if this opportunity is right for Rochester. A statewide system across cities would ensure consistency and a statewide certification process for those cities that, chose, that choose to use it. A couple pieces from our resolution, uh, just what, what the benefits of ranked choice voting are. So making voter, voting simpler for voters by eliminating the need for local nonpartisan primaries and consolidating two elections into one, saving the cost of primaries altogether in cities with odd uh, year local elections, demonstrably increasing voter participation, ensuring majority winners in a single election, which will likely benefit women and people of color who have historically been underrepresented in office, making voting easier for deployed military members and other citizens abroad by requiring one less election for them to receive and return their ballots on time, improving the civility of campaigning and reducing the influence of outside money in campaigns. As a charter city, Rochester would need to undergo a process to amend our city charter in order to implement ranked choice voting. Passage of this bill would allow, would assist our city in our own local process to consider a charter amendment by providing consistent standards for the administration of ranked choice voting in cities that choose to use it. I'm asking for your support for the bill and thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. And uh, next we have Simon Barnacle and I'd like to get uh, Nelsi Yang and M uh, Mark Bonhorst uh, ready to testify, you know, let's keep this really quick. So we have three chairs up here, so if you can, please get ready to testify, be up there as soon as the last a person is finished. Thank you. Mr. Barnacle. Good afternoon, my name is Simon Barnacle. I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt one second. You have a sign up uh, register up there, please be sure to sign in, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Simon Barnacle. Thank you, Senators, and thank you in particular to my Senator, Chairman Carlson, for the opportunity to speak here today. In my day job as a lawyer, I advise candidates and party committees on election administration. I've seen firsthand the way that voting systems affect outcomes and the way they shape voter perceptions. So today, I'm here in my personal capacity to offer my support for the Protect and Advance Democracy Act and also offer my thanks to Senator Morrison for her leadership on this issue. 
Rank choice voting is a straightforward reform that would make our democracy fairer by giving voters the ability to rank candidates in order of preference while ensuring that the winner of each election has earned majority support. It's different from our current system, which forces voters to sacrifice their interests. For example, many of us recall the odd calculus DFL voters engaged in during the 2020 presidential primary, where people who supported candidates like Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg and Elizabeth Warren had to decide whether to vote their true preferences or vote tactically for someone like Joe Biden, who seemed to have the best chance against Bernie Sanders, and vice versa. It's the same dynamic that Republicans encountered during the 2016 primary, and it's a dynamic that that play in any election, primary or general, where there are more than two candidates on the ballot. Ranked choice voting solves this problem, and so I trust that the implementation task force will conduct their work in an efficient and committed manner because Minnesotans believe that now is the time for change. New polling shows that a commanding majority of Minnesotans support the adoption of ranked choice voting, and it's easy to see why. In red states and blue states, and in cities across the state and country, ranked choice voting is being adopted because it gives voters more choice, it encourages broad coalition building, and it reduces polarization and gridlock. Here in Minnesota, the case for ranked choice voting is even greater. For years, partisan operatives have cynically promoted extreme third-party candidates in the hopes that they will siphon votes away from the DFL. This bill would end that practice by preventing third-party candidates from acting as spoilers. Last election, in 2022, every DFL member of this committee ran on a platform that included protecting democracy and ensuring free and fair elections. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, it is time to make good on that promise by supporting this important piece of legislation. Thank you. Next testifier, please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Chair Carlson and members of the committee, I'm Nelsie Yang. I'm the city council member representing St. Paul Ward 6, which is in the east side of St. Paul. I'm the first Hmong American woman and also the youngest person elected to the St. Paul City Council. So it's an honor to be here in front of you today. In St. Paul, we use ranked choice voting, and I fully support ranked choice voting because of the phenomenal experience that I had in my 2019 race as a first-time candidate, as a woman of color, as a renter, and as a young person. And first, I want to say that Having a fair and clean voting system right now does not mean that we cannot strive for more. We should always be striving for more. We should always be working toward equity because we know that there are many folks in our communities who get left out, especially folks who are from communities of color, folks who have recently become citizens. Maybe there are language barriers in our communities and as leaders, it is our duty and obligation to always be working to close those gaps. I represent the East Side, which is a community abundant in working class families, in immigrants, refugees, people of color, people who are diverse across class, gender, disability, and so much more. This is the demographic of my community, but also a demographic that I believe is the is what all of our communities are going to look like and, and continue to grow and look like every day, which is something that I'm so proud of. And it's important for us to have a system that will continue to support them, that will make sure that whether somebody is looking, uh, figuring out how they can vote, who they want to vote for, or if they are interested in voting, that we can make sure that no one is at a disadvantage from the start. And ranked choice voting makes sure that everybody is on that same level playing field, which is why I'm such a strong supporter of it. We need ranked choice voting statewide so that we can make sure that no matter where Minnesotans live, they know ex exactly how to cast their ballots. I also feel it's really important to make sure that we're using this system so that um, you know, every city, every uh, where that we utilize ranked choice voting, we also have the technology needed and the, the, the tools needed to make sure that everything is run smoothly also. Um, so I urge you to support ranked choice voting and continue building a democracy where everyone is in and no one is out, and also to make sure that we build camaraderie across all campaigns that run for office, which is something that I experienced, and it just that was just one of the best parts about my um, campaign in 2019. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Yang. And uh, I'm going to dismiss you from the, the seats there and ask uh, um, Mr. Sund to come up. We have Mr. Bonhorst here. 
So uh, please you, identify Mr. yourself for the record and continue. With yes, your thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Mark Bonhorst from Minneapolis. Uh, I voted in many uh, ranked choice voting elections. Uh, the system works. I'm a strong supporter of Senate File 2270. I want to make two quick points about presidential elections, which is something I've been um, studying and writing about for the past several years. First, I think that the, the task force, uh, force uh, remit, its, it's scope of, of uh, possible action, should include for presidential elections approval voting as well as ranked choice voting. Those two systems have not been studied in Minnesota yet, and superb League of Women Voters study in 2004 did not cover presidential elections. In fact, in the first elections in this country, the nation used approval voting. Two votes, one, one voter, two votes. Uh, the systems are very similar. They, they work equally well to deal with uh, spoiler voting, uh, but, rank, but uh, approval voting is much simpler. The technology is already in place. If the task force were to decide it wanted to uh, apply uh, alternative voting to a presidential election, it could recommend uh, an earlier election cycle uh, with approval voting, possibly because of the simplicity and the, uh, and the existence of the technology already. The second uh, thing I think the task force should be able to do is make strong recommendations about how the uh, Minnesota will count its electoral votes or, or its, it, the, re the results of its election when the inter interstate compact is in force and when we're talking about a national popular vote. The interstate compact relies on the states to determine the rules for their election systems and Minnesota law should be clear about that and the task force is, a be is the best place to work that through. I think Minnesota sh law should be clear that all the votes will be counted. There will be no, there's no longer a need for ranking. There's no longer a, read, a need for discarding any votes once you're talking about a national popular vote instead of a winner take all vote within the state itself. That is the system of um, alternative, that was the alternative election system that the founders envisioned for a national popular vote, at least those who were talking about a national popular vote. I think we could do no better than have our own system uh, be what the founders would have wanted. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Travis Bull Johnson. I'm the chair of the Constitutional Republic Party and former congressional candidate from CD7. I must have been one of those extreme candidates the other witness was referring to. I will agree with the sponsor of this bill that we do need to get rid of the toxicity within our current election system. We saw that from this from this very committee and the chair a couple of weeks ago when he tried to eliminate legalized marijuana now party from the 2024 ballots. I like the opportunities that ranked choice voting gives. However, the devil will be in the details on how it's run. As we have already seen with the, mar the marijuana legalization, this party can mess up just about, this uh, institution can mess up just about anything. While going over this proposal, I could not help but notice a number up for the task force, including a representative from labor appointed by the government, legislative Democrats and Republicans, four different groups based on race, and two disability groups. What is missing, however, are some major stakeholders, primarily the parties outside the duopoly who this change will drastically affect. Mr. I therefore Johnson, ask Mr. Johnson, that a position I'm on the task to force be allocated to minor parties. One Mr. last Johnson. note to close. Education is very important for RCV to be accepted. Last year, I was at the Libertarian Party Convention, a group who pretty much overwhelmingly approves of our Mr. Johnson, we have to, we have to cut you off. We, we've exceeded the time allowed for the uh, proponents. So uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sun, but uh, we will have to listen to you offline. So now we have the, the op opponents, and we have uh, uh, Eric Van Mechelen, Linda Blair, and Kathy Kranz. Uh, please come up and occupy the three seats, or the two seats available. And as soon as, uh, as soon as one person is completed, then the next person should come up and take the seat. Senator Morrison, perhaps you could uh, come you over to, to the side here. We sure. could get three people up there. So please be concise. You can see that it's very important that we hear all of you. So uh, when we start, we'll start the timer. The signage, the signage. Right here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, pen. Thank you. So Mr. Van Mechelen. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Good afternoon, Senators and everyone in the audience. My name is Eric Van Mecklen. Received 100,000 votes in the Secretary of State race in the primary of 2022. 
restoring voter confidence and warranted trustworthiness in the election process is a top priority right now. Until trust is restored, it is hasty, risky, and I am arguing inappropriate to complicate matters with a new voting process and system. At the same time, there are presently discussions happening locally and nationally about the merits of hand counting and hand tallying elections for increased transparency and verifiably accurate results reflecting the will of all voters. If certain counties or the state of Minnesota went away from the unreliable electronic systems currently in use in the future, but had already passed legislation for ranked choice voting, then a heavy burden would be placed on election staff because ranked choice is much more laborious when hand counted as demonstrated by Minneapolis's November 2009 election, wherein even with advanced notice and 102 election judges took 15 days to complete. Thank you. Ms. Blair. Hello, members. My name is Linda Blair. I am a voter of Bloomington and an election judge in the elections that are held there. Um, voting laws should protect elections. They should be fair, inclusive, equitable, and uncomplicated. Ranked choice voting complicates the election process for the voters and the counting of the votes. Ranked choice voting adds unnecessary expense and we have found it unpopular in Bloomington after the first election using ranked choice voting for city elections. As an election judge, I saw many voters who were unclear and confused and those that understood the process expressed disgust over its complications. I personally witnessed many spoiled ballots from diverse voters who use English as their second language, consequently causing them frustration and taking them longer to complete the ballot. Many races go beyond the first round. This leaves a voter who ranks a candidate only in the first round or the same candidate across all rounds in jeopardy of exhausting their ballot. While other voters who consistently choose the loser of each round, sec a second, third, and maybe fourth vote through this redistribution. Is this equitable? Is this equal? Is this inclusive or exclusive to all voters' rights? I ask you to reject considering ranked choice voting for Minnesota. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Kranz, a Bloomington voter. Every citizen who votes should be guaranteed that their votes count equally. I encourage you, as you listen to the testimonies, that you think about your future re-election under ranked choice voting and pay attention to the makeup of your constituency. What happens to your voters under ranked choice voting? Well, all the unproven advantages RCV proponents throw at you, throw it at you cannot avoid that there will be a substantial number of your constituents whose ballots are exhausted in every race. There is a disparity among the voters due to some having one vote count, while others' votes are continued in round tabulation. In Bloomington alone, who enjoys large minority pockets, an average of 7% of its votes cast, votes cast were exhausted. That was 1,200 ballots of voters who will become disenfranchised for any number of frustrating reasons. What is the harm of disenfranchised voters, the very voters who might be voting for you? Voter turnout is impeded. The turnout actually decreased in Bloomington during the 2021 RCV election, and it denies voting power by excluding marginal and diverse voters, which makes RCV inequitable for all. As a result of RCV inequities, Bloomington has petitioned to put RCV back on the ballot. Please be careful what you vote for and vote no on SF2770. Chair, Please identify Carl. yourself for the record. Right. Cheryl Carlson, members of the Senate Elections Committee. My name is Brian Cook. I'm the Director of Elections Policy for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for the opportunity to express some of our concerns with Senate File 2270. The Minnesota Chamber, which represents more than 6,300 businesses with over 500,000 employees, support changes to Minnesota's state election process to allow for greater voter contact and participation. We believe that Minnesota should maintain the traditional method of balloting where voters select one candidate per office sought. While RCV is promoted as a means to reduce polarization, increase participation, and lower costs, academic studies and actual experience call into question those conclusions. Minnesota's experience with RCV bears this out. 
RCV presents voters who have just one preference in a race with a dilemma. Either vote for a candidate whom the voter does not know or support, or risk having their voting power diminished by a person who makes more than one selection. The bill also delegates the work of developing the implementation of a statewide RCV system to a 23-member task force. This task force has representation from local units of government, labor unions, and others. While it has outsized representations from other organizations that advocate for RCV, the business community is notably left out with no seat at the table. It is our strongly held belief that Minnesota businesses remain active and engaged in elections not only because they represent a collective voice for the private sector, just as labor unions represent a collective voice for their workers, but because policy and political decisions impact them just as much. Finally, our state's participation in elections and our election laws and practices are held up as a point of pride nationally. Minnesota has a long-standing tradition of requiring bipartisan support for significant election law changes, a standard that has promoted stability and helped Minnesotans retain their voice at critical moments. We believe bipartisanship should remain the standard in this policy area, especially when it comes to fundamental changes to the way in which we conduct elections. Significant modifications to our electoral system that are not consensus-based will lead to a back and forth of changes based on whoever is in power. It's a result that's not in the best interest of Minnesotans. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. We we have a slight change in. Uh, I'm sorry. We still I still have. Uh, Ms. We're at Jonathan Anistead. Okay. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senators, members of this committee, and of course members that I know personally. Thank you for welcoming me here today. My name is Jonathan Anistead. I am the chair of the Minnesota Election Integrity.org Committee. We're a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to all aspects of election operations here in Minnesota. A recent Real Clear Politics poll found that 62% of Americans are very concerned or somewhat concerned about the state of elections in this country. Ranked choice voting is not the solution to an already ailing election system in Minnesota. It is a solution in search of a problem that it does not solve. It will only make a bad system worse. I've been involved in Minnesota elections since the Coleman Franken recount, the Ember Dayton recount as a team lead, a volunteer election judge, poll watcher, and now I chair the largest volunteer election committee in the state with over 200 members statewide. We were formed in 2021 and have eight subcommittees working on all aspects of election integrity here in Minnesota. Please visit our website if you have any more questions. I encourage you to look into the formation and background of FairVote, the very well-funded organization to the tune of $1.3 million this year, pushing RCV in Minnesota. The funding all comes from left-leaning, big-money organizations. Please ask yourself these questions. Why are the Democrats pushing RCV and that concept so hard? Why are they so well funded with full-time employees dedicated to this effort here in Minnesota? I ask you to please educate yourself as to how RCV works by listening to the other testifiers here today. It does not adhere to the guarantee, one person, one vote, that America was built on. I thank you so much for your time and uh, have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Anstead. Now, uh, Ms. Barb Sutter. Barb Sutter from Bloomington. I've come here today to ask several crucial questions that proponents of ranked choice voting never seem to answer. I hope you will ask for these answers too. Why are we considering trying to change our voting system to one that excludes votes or choices in races rather than counting every vote? Why are we trying to change our voting system to one which is more confusing to our perhaps more marginalized and diverse populations? Why are we forcing voters to make choices they may not want just to ensure all their votes or choices count in a race to the very end? Why are we providing an atmosphere for candidates to create a mathematical strategy by which to win rather than basic and honest campaigning? 
Why are we considering a voting scheme that a majority of the time does not result in a peer majority, but rather a diluted majority of the last two candidates standing? And finally, how is the current one person, one vote a threat to democracy? Not inclusive, not diverse, and not equitable or equal. Thank you. I'm Ellen Cousins from Minnetonka. RCV was ex studied extensively and rejected by our Minnetonka City Charter Commission. Unfortunately, the City Council, in a pandemic panic, bowed to extensive fair vote lobbying and decided to not to, to take the advice of the Commission and put it on our ballot in November 2020 anyway. Most people in our city had no idea what ranked choice voting was, and getting the message out during a pandemic was challenging, to say the least, for our small, resident-funded group. We found during the 2021 election, while door knocking, people still had no idea how to use RCV for the upcoming election and questioned the practical benefits of changing our election system. This is in spite of our city spending thousands of dollars to educate our citizens. RCV does not deliver the promised benefits. It's simply too complicated to explain in simple language and has no place in an election system that has been promoted by our Secretary of State as one of the best in the nation. Evidence of this is the 24 definitions in this bill to explain RCV. One shouldn't have to use a dictionary to vote. Please vote no on SF 2270, and thank you for your time. And now we have two uh, people testifying via Zoom, Ray Parker and Elna Niehoff. Hello, my name is Ray Parker from Rochester. I strongly oppose Bill SF 2270. This bill moves us in totally the wrong direction. Ranked choice vote is not only confusing to the average voter, but does not, in my opinion, in most elections reflect the majority will of who the voters want in office representing their interests. It negates a large amount of people in a second vote during the instant runoff vote. As voters of the top two candidates, only get to use their first vote. Example, the near bottom of the list of candidates can, after multiple runoffs, become the winner of the election race, fully opposed to what the initial vote showed as the top two contenders. These multiple runoffs have an ever-increasing possibility of fraud to be played out and for ballots to be spoiled by misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the instructions, canceling their votes. Please vote no for two SF2270 and instead use our tried and true one vote, one ballot, paper ballots in one day, not a season of voting that is outlasting the season of hunting, football, and pumpkin spice season. We don't want an election fraud season. Let's tighten our voting laws, not loosen them. Thank you. Ms. Niehoff. Mr. Chair and the committee members, my name is Elena Niehoff. I'm from Rochester, Minnesota. I'm testifying in opposition to the bill SF-2270. In my opinion, this bill is unconstitutional because it does not guarantee every Minnesotan that their vote will be counted in the election process. In traditional election, every submitted ballot that follows the instruction is counted toward the result. But this is not the case in the ranked choice voting, where the exhausted ballots do not count toward the final tally the exhausted ballots could be discarded by the series of manipulation. Overall, ranked choice voting is the complicated system of voter manipulation. Please vote no for the bill SF2270. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Niha. 
We are now ready to go to amendments. Amendments from the committee. Senator Morrison has returned. And Senator Morrison, we had discussed that you would have a person who did not testify, uh, but would be the uh, backup as your expert. And so we welcome Ms. Jean Massey to the, to the table. Amendments, may Members, any amendments? Any discussion? Mr. Chair? Senator Grant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Morrison, the, uh, the task force, it seems to be uh, in conflict with the issues of, uh, or what the bill is, that you want to grant the ability in a broad perspective in municipalities, one where they already have the ability to implement it if they so choose, and then two, the task force is then going to determine in some future date when, what the rules and regulations and what the best practices and procedures and policies would be. It seems to be the, the card is before the horse. M Mr. Chair and Senator Coran, the, the task force is tasked with um, recommending plans for statewide implementation of ranked choice voting. Local jurisdictions under this bill would be able to implement it um, by referendum or... What's the other way can do it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, Mr. Chair. Senator Morrison. Um, you know, one of the local testifiers said it was, it was great to get rid of the barriers to implementing it. And you just described that it's available through referendum if the citizens so choose. So do we know if that the testifier was considering the citizens, the barrier? What are the barriers that that testifier was speaking of? Senator Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Coran, I, I wasn't present for that, so I'm, I'm not really sh certain one, I guess, one what of your, your question is. Mr. Chair? Yep. Senator Coran. One of your testifiers uh, testified that it was uh, great that this is being, could be put forth, led by the state level, um, to remove the barriers. And I'm not aware, there, in your own words, that this is an available option for citizens who choose to do that today. But I'm concerned that the person testifying considered the citizens the barrier. Senator Morris. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Coran, uh, if I understand your question, I, I think the idea with ranked choice voting, and one of the things that's so great about it, is it does lower barriers for participation. More people are invited to join in our democracy. More people are invited to run for office. Um, so uh, it's a much more inclusive approach. Mr. Chair. Senator Coran. Um, Senator Morrison, what were the barriers or what stopped somebody from running for office today? Are the election, the registration fees too high? Or what are the barriers that, are, that prevented anybody from stepping forward in any municipal race from being able to participate in, the, in an election? Senator Morris. Mr. Chair, Senator Coran, I think there are a lot of people who feel disenfranchised in our communities and in our country. Um, and when more people are invited to participate, uh, more, more, that is what would lower the barriers. Mr. I, Chair? I think that um, uh, my testifier wanted to add something to that comment as well. Uh, if that's okay, Ms. Mr. Maxie. Chair. Ms. Mr. Maxie. Chair, Senator Cran, I think the bill addresses breaking down regulatory barriers for local jurisdictions to use ranked choice voting. The five cities that currently use ranked choice voting in Minnesota have two things in common. They have a city charter that can be amended to use ranked choice voting, and they hold elections in odd years, so they can do standalone elections in odd years, 2021, 2023, so it's straightforward for them to do that. Other municipalities have the authority to do it, like a Rochester and a Red Wing who testified, but because they hold elections in even years, there are all kinds of regulatory uh, barriers with respect to ballot design and conformity and other measures that this bill addresses in the local standards component of this bill, allowing those jurisdictions, plus any non-charter jurisdiction, a school district, other cities, to do it 
as well, as well as county. So those are the barriers that this local options component breaks down for communities. Mr. Chair. Yep. Uh, Ms. Ms. Massey, can you please be sure to identify yourself and your, the organization that you represent so that we, the record knows who you yes. are? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Gene Massey, I'm the Executive Director of Fair Vote Minnesota. Thank you. Senator Cran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so the, the barriers that you speak of are, are due process. And so you didn't describe one barrier that prevents it from being put into place. What you describe is you would just rather have it much easier to bypass the will of, the, of all citizens through a vote or a referendum or to follow the proper procedures. And so I don't see those as being barriers. And, uh, and so um, I am concerned that, no, or that anyone today, as you described or as has been described, that there's anything preventing anybody from doing it. Yeah, due process. When we're looking to change an entire election system, it should be thorough. It should be require a thorough vetting system before we go through and upend the entire process. When, when we look at the, all of the statements that, uh, that have been made today about how wonderful it makes it, um, I think there's some key issues that are missing. I think, there's, I think there's certainly some constitutional issues, but you know, we've got all votes matter. You know? Well, not in this case. In this case, we have many votes that are exhausted. And an individual doesn't know. Do they, in, in the plurality system, they know their vote. They selected their person. They know who wins. They know where they, where they stood, whether they won or lost. The, to lower the temperature, I don't know if you've noticed, but the major, two major cities that I track, I grew, I'm a Frogtown boy. I'm a city boy by heart, and I moved to a rural area. Those that have implemented, now we're getting to see the results of, of the elections and the quality of the candidates and the, in the, uh, in the outcomes of the candidates. Prior to that, I think you knew who the candidates were because everybody had to work for your vote to, to win that majority vote. Today, it's more like participation trophies because you get to be on the ballot and you hope you win. I don't think it's accomplished anything that, that the stated goals have set, that set forth. Then we look in, to me, I just look and kind of measure the operational aspects of the key executive body of those cities, at least their two major cities, the outcomes haven't been that great. I think we've been a downward slide, and I'm not sure we can help them out of it. Basic city services are going unmet. If you guys tried to drive to, around the Capitol here or get to the freeway, core basic services, they're the executive body that makes those decisions. So the outcomes improved, the operation and the function of the city for the citizens, I think it's, I think it's disenfranchised the citizens every day. We talk about, I think that one of your, one of the statements were uh, polarization and extremism. And I know we've talked in this committee a lot about how do we, how do we protect election workers or the violence that has happened someplace else that might happen here. I see a lot of that. But I see it in the, in the two cities we talk about. Unfortunately, and I don't agree with the, 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 um, the threats that have been made against the city council members in Minneapolis, but those threats appear by the very people who elected them, who participated in that process. So do they feel disenfranchised that their vote didn't matter or the people they elected were not, were not qualified or they're not performing? It seems like that temperature has raised, been increased dramatically because of this type of system and the people that have been elected. I don't think it's a party uh, of candidate protection process. It certainly appears to be a party protection process as far as the desire, because um, I truly believe if this is a, a great deal for everybody, it wouldn't be sitting before this committee today. Um, Mr. Chair, I just have, I, I don't know where to begin. There's just so many issues with it. I'll, I'll um, leave it open for other members who have other, other questions, but um, I don't think this is gonna increase the uh, um, comfort, understanding, and trust in the election systems. I think one of the testifiers said over 64% don't trust it. We gotta get back to transparency and a system that we trust. None of the bills that we've heard in this committee, this body, the collection of them, leads us to transparency and more trust. This bill does not, does, does not as well. So, Mr. Chair, I'll leave it with that and maybe I'll have questions later. Thank you, Senator Crenn. Um, Senator Matthews. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Coran's uh, excellent points is a tough act to follow, but I am gonna give it a shot. Uh, Mr. Chair, right from the outset, the uh, proponents of the bill talked about uh, that this is going to be the tool 
to decrease toxicity, uh, that this is the tool that will advance democracy. Uh, and I would suggest a better tool for decreasing toxicity is maybe all of the millions and millions of dollars of dark money that flowed in and flooded our television ads for months and months that absolutely slandered opposing candidates, that might be a better place to start uh, to go after the toxicity that we are all feeling in elections. Uh, because that's ultimately the responsibility uh, of us as candidates and how we conduct ourselves and how we treat uh, our opponent in the race, how we treat our supporters in the race, how we treat our opponent's supporters in the race. And I have tried to make deliberate choices uh, to treat every person in my district uh, with respect, even when we have disagreement on issues that have come up. And I think locally, uh, you, there is a, a much better temperature uh, because of the discussions that we're able to have that we don't see at state levels, at federal levels, because there seems to be this unfettered onslaught of outside dark money influences that just come in and pummel the airwaves. Uh, I think that would be much better than a ranked choice system that has had mixed testimony. We've had multiple cities, and I will admit, of cities that are using RCV now. Some have come down and, and uh, said, you know, we like it, here's how it's been in our city. And then we had other cities that came and shared some real frustrations that we need to take into serious consideration before making a major, major policy change uh, to our elections. Um, the claim was made about uh, you third parties siphoning off voters, and Mr. Chair, you and I both know that that's not uh, limited to one side or the other. Uh, in fact, arguably, that's how we've gotten uh, DFL governors and Republican governors elected uh, in the past 20 years uh, that did not hit the 50% threshold, uh, but third party candidates had enough where both parties have been in that position of saying, well, uh, plenty won in 02 and 06 because of third party races there, and Dayton won in 2010 because of a third party race there. So that is not unique uh, to one side or the other. Uh, but Minnesotans have all had the same opportunity with the same list of candidates to pick the one that you believe best represents your interests. And uh, the discussion was made on how it's impacted uh, primaries as well. And uh, I admittedly, Mr. Chair, was not a part of the 2020 DFL primary, so I cannot speak to whether or not uh, that was as the testifier stated it was. But I do want to clear up um, that that testifier appeared to try to characterize what our 2016 GOP primary was. And the uh, characterization made there uh, was very, very inaccurate. Uh, we had a very clean and smooth uh, process for our state there. Uh, and we elected uh, Marco Rubio in our, uh, uh, on that primary day at our caucus, and we were the only state in the whole country that did so. And then we came back around and a different candidate was chosen and the rest of the election went on from there. Uh, but Mr. President, Mr. Chair, this bill raises far more questions than it has answers for. And if you ask most uh, average Minnesotans on the street how this will appear to play out, uh, most people have no idea how ranked choice voting works or how the counting works. And I've been trying to figure it out for many of my six years here in the election, and I still struggle to understand how all the pieces uh, form together. You ask most Minnesotans, and it feels like you dump all the results into a blender, you push it on high, you power chop it all up, and someone pours it all out and announces who the winner is days, if not a week or more, uh, after the election. And we have, we've brought this argument before in previous bills, uh, Mr. Chair, that to push for more transparency in our election process, we should be pushing ourselves towards faster and cleaner counts and recounts of our ballots. We used to have it for decades. 
And now uh, the, par the powers that be are trying to condition our citizens to go, hey, it might be two, three, five days, seven days, 10 days before we hear a result, and that's perfectly normal. There's nothing to see here. And that, as Senator Cran keeps pointing out, that moves us away from transparency and to more distrust and to more room uh, for uh, error, for questions, for unanswered uh, uh, stipulations that go on. We should, we, it is 2023 in the United States of America. There is no reason to not have darn election results the same night that we cast our ballots. And this will absolutely move us far away and lock in permanently a days and weeks long counting process where someone appears behind from, out from behind the curtain uh, and announces who a winner is. Uh, and I agree with the uh, testifiers that shared, this is my final comment, Mr. Chair, that I have serious concerns with the constitutional one person, one vote principle because if you and I go into the ballot booth, Mr. Chair, and we rank our three, four, five, however many there are candidates, and you've selected the candidate that starts out in first place, and I started ranking them, and for simplicity's sake, rank them from bottom to top, then you've only had a vote for one person, that you, you've had one vote for one person, I've had one vote for the fourth place person, then one vote for the third place person, then one vote for the second place person. And finally, maybe at the end, a week later, I have my fourth vote cast uh, for the ultimate winner who might have defeated your candidate that you voted for one time all the way along. And that will seriously weaken not everyone uh, who ranks the same number of people, uh, will have the same weight. You'll see campaigns saying, in order to give us a better shot, don't rank anyone else. We saw that uh, already in city elections that were going on. There are just way too many problems with this. What's wrong with one person, one vote? I would rather have a runoff election. Please don't, please don't. Let's, let's follow the Senate rules of decorum here, please. Let's have one person, one vote. I'd rather have runoff elections that some states do than this, even though that is more hassle and an extra day uh, and, and uh, more expense. But that gives everybody equal access uh, to a second runoff vote. And there are just way too many unanswered questions with this bill, uh, Mr. Chair. So with that, I'd urge members to reject this. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, may I just, may I just comment? <laughs> thank you, Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Senator Matthews. I share your appetite for campaign finance reform. We should talk more about that. I, uh, dark money has had a very um, uh, ill effect on our elections and on our democracy. Uh, Citizens United um, opened up an entire new era uh, in the United States. But you know, when you think about the big challenges before us, and we have many, they are challenges that we are going to need to bring big, broad coalitions together to solve them. And ranked choice voting is a way to do that. Um, and I do, before, and time is short, I would really love for Gene Massey to address this idea that this, this one person, one vote, I think there's some bad information that's being shared, and I'd love for the testifier to clear that up for all of us, please. Ms. Massey. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Chair Carlson. So uh, again, Jean Massey with Fair Vote Minnesota. It's important to understand the process of how ranked choice voting works, and then you can understand the uh, constitutional uh, foundation upon which it rests. And recall that ranked choice voting was taken to court after Minneapolis adopted it. It was uh, challenged at the lower court, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court under Justice Magnuson found it unanimously constitutional. And that's because it comports with one person, one vote. In every round of counting, everyone has one vote that counts. So in any election, we as voters rank our options, first, second, third choice, et cetera, simple change to the ballot in that way. And rather than doing the second runoff election like a George do, Georgia does, it triggers an instant runoff. So that's why it is often called instant runoff voting. So that if no candidate, upon counting for his choices, garners an absolute majority of the vote, then the least favorite candidate is defeated, 
And then the second choices on those ballots are now counted. Those ballots are reallocated to the second choices only from that defeated candidate. If my first choice is still in the race, my first choice continues to count. So everyone has a vote counting in every round, and that process continues until one candidate emerges with a majority of continuing votes. It's really that straightforward, and that's why it is always found not just in courts here in Minnesota, but across the country as a constitutional voting method. Thank you. Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Morrison, uh, you're some of the testifiers who testified in support of this, made statements of saying that this makes this ranked choice voting will make it easier for military members. I'd like to know how. Uh, there was also statements made that um, our present system today uh, limits voters in the way that they can vote. Uh, I'd like to know how. Uh, there are statements made of different pollings that were just, uh, brought forward showing that a major majority of Minnesota citizens favor ranked choice voting. I'd like to see the polls and how many people were considered in those polls rather than the small 400 or 5,000, whatever, uh, in, in respect to the number of voters that we have in this state. So I'm very concerned about uh, the, the statements that are made here. And then uh, how will ranked choice voting affect our electoral votes, and that was brought up by one of the testifiers also. And uh, so maybe you can uh, address some of those concerns that were made by some of the testifiers and uh, some of the polling that supposedly was uh, brought forward. I, I didn't see any polling that was brought forward to us to show that 75% of the people in the United States uh, are in Minnesota support ranked choice voting. I'd like to see the, the polls and how many people were involved with them. Thank you. Senator um, Morris. Mr. Chair, I'd like a roll call on the vote, please. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson, those were a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I am going to ask Jean Massey to answer the question about polling and the military. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Morrison. Uh, Chair Carlson, so there was a recent study conducted by Expedition Strategies on ranked choice voting to uh, evaluate just how much support or, and awareness there is about ranked choice voting across Minnesota. The poll showed, uh, without any uh, basic information, that a majority, 54%, and this is a very recent poll, of Minnesotans support ranked choice voting and would like to see it used. With a little bit more education about the system, that support climbs to 64%. All of that information is available on our website and elsewhere if you want to see the details of that poll. That's fully available and we'll be happy to make it available to members of the committee. Um, with respect to the... Uh, uh, additional advantage that ranked choice voting provides for overseas and military voters. It's because of the time that it takes to uh, send ballots out to military voters and overseas voters and get them returned. It simply re uh, reduces uh, the need to get them back and forth. So that's why several states in southern uh, in the southern states of, of the country use ranked choice voting that require runoffs because they don't have the need to get use the additional time to get them out to voters and back. So if we were to institute a ranked choice voting process or a uh, runoff process in our state elections here in Minnesota and do that in the traditional way, that would be difficult for overseas and military voters and ranked choice voting simply makes that uh, process the same for every voter you rank and in every election there's an instant runoff process that would be used. Well, Mr. Chair, I'd like to see the data. I'd like, to see, I'd like to see some stuff. I mean, you're talking polls, you're talking, but I'd like to see how many people were invo actually involved with those polls, and actually, were they all voters, or were they just people at random? And uh, what you're bringing forward is good, good speaking points here, but it doesn't show me the facts. Chair Carlson, I just want to highlight that that poll was a random poll, and it was among equally split Democrats, Republicans, and Independents that showed that support for ranked choice voting. And again, we can make that available to all of the members. Thank you, Ms. Massey. Uh, next, next question, uh, Senator Mitchell. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Morrison, for bringing this forward. Um, I just want to say, I, you know, I support this. There is a question in there, and I'll be mindful of time. But uh, this is something I've always been, even before I ran for office, interested in organically, because especially with presidential elections, it seems like I always call it a clown car of candidates, where you're getting a dozen or more candidates. And, you know, talking about voting with friends, strategizing, not voting for the person you might care about the most or who aligns with you the most, but instead which one you think might make it through the wickets of the primary and then eventually get elected. And, and we should be able to, to vote for you know, who, who we care about. Um, as an election judge, I've also seen this, and uh, especially in our local nonpartisan elections, for example, my city has elections at large, so sometimes for just one council seat, there might be nine people fighting for it. And um, even if they all equally do the work, I've seen moderate candidates who are kind of all equally good completely split the vote where one really fringe person gets in because of that. And then, and I've seen my whole community be upset because like, how did this happen? So, so I think that benefits it. So my question is, um, I really like that this puts it back, it looks like, in the hands of the community. Can you talk about just the extent that it's difficult for communities to make that choice now? And then some people make it sound like you have to do it, or if you did it and didn't like it, you wouldn't be able to take that back. I mean, this is really a choice, isn't it? Uh, Chair Ms. Carlson, uh, Senator Mitchell, yes, yeah, so the local component uh, piece of this bill would not be mandatory for any jurisdiction, would allow all local jurisdictions, a city, a school district, or a county to adopt ranked choice voting if they so choose. And it could do that by ordinance or to, for a ballot measure if they wanted to make sure the voters had an opportunity to weigh in on that. So it breaks down the barrier that now a whole class of cities are unable to use ranked choice voting, and, and all the counties almost, because they don't have their own stat or home rule authority to do that. So it breaks that barrier down for all those communities, which is why the League of Minnesota Cities has this in their legislative agenda to support it, because it really le levels the playing field for all those jurisdictions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Port, uh, Senator Port. Uh, no? OK. Uh, Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Er, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Mr. <laughs> Chair, Senator Carlson. So, um, I yeah, really don't. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've been giving this a great deal of thought over the last few years, and one of the things. So, I have three quick points um, that I've often reflected on: is what what were the framers? What what were they thinking? And if they had known about ranked choice voting. What would have been their view on it? And what would Madison, Franklin, Washington have said about ranked choice voting? And I don't know the answer, and I've been, but I've been thinking a lot about it because they've offered us so much guidance over the generations of, of what democracy and a republic and America should look like, and they've been an inspiration to me. But I do know this. Um, they didn't trust us. Because we couldn't pick the president, the Electoral College picked the president, um, the legis state legislatures picked the Senate, but they did elect, allow the people to pick the, the House of Representatives. And so over the years, I think we all can agree that the evolution of this incredible nation has been an evolution of the right to vote. And franchise, each generation has extended that right, whether it's to um, people of color or women or 18-year-olds and most recently um, fel felons that are out on parole. And that's what's made America unique. But the reason... I, and then first comment. Second comment, I've heard a lot when I hear about ranked choice voting, people will say, well, voters didn't know. Voters were un, didn't know what they were voting for. Voters were uninformed. And I want to remind um, my colleagues, maybe that's a good reason for you to vote for civics when it's on the floor in the near future. Um, thank you for that little um, thumbs up. But, and thirdly, um, 
the reason I came forward a couple years ago in favor of ranked choice voting, and the reason I'm going to be voting yes on this um, bill, is because it gets, from what Gene Massey has told me, is it gets rid of mudslinging. It gets rid of um, um, dragging people through the mud. It gets rid of negative ads. It gets rid of character assassination. And maybe you want to address that, I don't know. But I do know that um, um, Senator um, Matthews, you said something to the effect that, um, um, I don't remember what you said, but it, it, it was insightful. Um, but the, the, the um, but our, our, our young kids, they don't feel a place in our country because all they see is negativity. They see us tearing each other down instead of building each other up. And can you imagine if all the campaigns in this country were all about building each other up instead of tearing each other down? And we, uh, we focused on our, can our opponents and our own strengths rather than the weaknesses of our candidates and our opponents. And that's the kind of democracy and republic I'd love to see leaving my grandchildren. If ranked choice voting is a step towards that, then I'll be voting for it. And so with that said, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I hope I got it right that time. <laughs> Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move that Senate file 2270 be recommended to pass and re-referred to state gov. Mr. Chair. Uh, we have a motion. Uh, and up for okay. a while, and you didn't see me. Uh, we didn't get you on the list. Sorry. With that, uh, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I've been uh, in this election committee the whole time, and so many times we had the Secretary of State or a representative from the Secretary of State. So I guess first question would be, uh, maybe it was answered before I, I had to leave for a while. So uh, have they? spoke uh, in favor or against, and then also the, the, the state parties, where do they stand on this too? So that would be one question, but two parts to it. Senator Marston. Mr. Chair and Senator Dornick, thank you. You know, we were, have been in extensive conversation with the Secretary of State's office, and this bill reflects those conversations. Uh, I think the Secretary of State had another, or he had planned to join us today, but had to be elsewhere. Um, so I think it's fair to say that they are neutral on this bill. Um, and I, I don't know, actually, if the state parties have an official stand on ranked choice voting. <laughs> Thank you. We, we have a motion. The clerk will take the roll. Mr. Chair. Senator Carlson. Uh, yes. Senator Westland. Yes. Senator Coran. No. Senator Anderson. No. Senator Barr. Nope. Senator Bolden. Yes. Senator Swadzinski. Yes. Senator Dornick. No. Senator Limmer. Senator Marty. Yes. Senator Matthews. Cutting this off, I vote no in protest. Senator Mitchell. Yes. Senator Port. Yes. Senator Rest. Yes. Senator Limmer. There being eight yeses and five noes, the uh, bill is uh, recommended to pass and forwarded to State Government Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please, no, 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 no displays in the Senate chamber, for the chambers. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Morris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Coleman. Please exit quickly. We have Senator Coleman's bill. And quickly and quietly, please. 
Uh, Senator Coleman has uh, Senate File 1570, and we have a uh, hard stop at 5 o'clock. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. This is going to be a little bit less exciting. I apologize. <laughs> Um, as was presented to you all a few weeks ago, after each U.S. Census, congressional apportionment takes place. Each state draws the boundaries for its congressional districts following its own procedures and statutes. Since the 1980 census, an appointed judicial panel has adopted Minnesota's congressional and legislative redistricting plan. Historically, the re redistricting plan has been challenged in the court, and an election official from one of the state's fastest growing counties has been named as a representative defendant on behalf of all 87 counties, along with the Secretary of State. When the 2021 redistricting plan was challenged in court, Kendra Olson of Carver County Elections and Licensing Manager individually and on behalf of all Minnesota County Chief Election Officers was named a co-defendant. Carver County was brought into this case as a nominal party and only for purposes of ensuring that any order issued by the court could be imposed on all county auditors, chief election officers across the state. On August 31st, 2022, an order for the special redistricting panel was issued, which stated Carver County could be jointly and severally severally liable with the Secretary of State for up to $475,927 in attorney's fees and costs. This result was expected. Despite valid, equitable arguments, the judicial panel is required to apply the law, which does hold defendants responsible for paying the prevailing party's attorney's fees and costs. Historically, the defendant Secretary of State's office has requested and the legislature has approved paying any ordered attorney's fees and costs in full, alleviating any financial impact on the representative defendant county. The 2020 U.S. Census reported that the state of Minnesota, with their population and Carver County's population, Carver County was therefore the fastest growing county. As precedent has recognized, imposing the court-ordered attorney's fees and costs upon a single county is an unreasonable and financial obligation to be levied upon such a small segment of Minnesota citizens. The costs of this case are historically reimbursed by legislative action by way of the Secretary of State's budget, which is set by the legislature with an allocation from the state's general fund. Uh, with that in mind, on behalf of the county, uh, we have introduced a bill to cover these costs and fees. Uh, and I do have an amendment, Mr. Chair. Um, it was brought to my attention that the original bill did not reflect the interest rate uh, on these fees. Senator Coleman, that is the A1 author's amendment? Correct. Uh, Senator Westland moves the A1 author's amendment on Senate file 1570. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Senator Coleman. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I believe that I have a testifier. Um, maybe. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you have a reluctant testifier. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and members. Um, Thanks to Senator Coleman for bringing Senate File 1570 uh, to appropriate money to the Office of the Secretary of State to pay attorney's fees awarded uh, by the court in the 2022 Watson v. Simon redistricting litigation. The topic may be familiar to you, uh, as Senator Coleman alluded, um, as the uh, it was included just a few weeks ago when Secretary Simon was here to present uh, the office's budget overview. Uh, you also uh, heard at that time um, history of the legislature paying these fees um, as Peter Watson presented. The Office of the Secretary of State and Carver County were necessary parties here, uh, even though our office's roles in redistricting are really the implementation of a plan um, once adopted. Interest is accruing on these fees at a rate of 5% right now, and the state could save nearly $10,000 uh, if, if they chose to pay these fees today versus on July 1st. The court understood, as previous legislators have, um, that the costs associated with this necessary litigation would ultimately be paid by the taxpayers. As interest is accruing, we hope we can work together to pay this amount quickly to avoid further costs to Minnesota. Thanks so much. 
Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Any questions from the members? Amendments? Senator Colvin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is um, a big deal for my county, so I appreciate you uh, giving us the time, and thank you to the Secretary of State's office for coming to testify on behalf. And thank you for bringing the 1570. Do I have a motion? Uh, oh, we're going to lay it. This is going to be laid over, so thank you. With that being the uh, last business we had for today, we are adjourned.